seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. But if I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with David Christian of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Mr. Christian, can you start with a little bit of background on yourself uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, 1946 in Muskegon, Michigan. My family lived in Muskegon Heights, Michigan. Uh, I grew up there. Uh, we moved when I was five years old, I guess, to the home that I grew up in, the only one that I remember. And was that still in Muskegon? That was in Muskegon Heights, okay. yeah. Uh, went through grade school, junior high, high school, graduated in 1964. All right. And what did your family do for a living? My father uh, worked for Tyler Sales, which was uh, Drury's Beer. Mm -hmm. He was the warehouse manager, and so I grew up uh, helping him on Saturdays, wash the trucks, load the trucks, mm -hmm. doing that. Uh, my mother worked for Stanley Home Products for several years. Uh, and then my, my dad left that job and worked at Bennett Pumps in Muskegon Heights. They made the pumps for gas station. Mm -hmm. And he retired from there and they moved on to Florida. And I uh, graduated high school in 64. Uh, Vietnam was just starting. Wasn't much in the papers about it, but uh, a friend and I that graduated together decided that we were going to going to Marine Corps together. Right. So we went in and he couldn't get in. What was your motivation at that point? Just a whim or what was attractive about the Marine Corps? No, uh, I knew some guys that had been in the Marine Corps, you know, older of course, and the uniform, you know, like everybody says, that uniform is a, is a killer. So I thought that was pretty impressive, and then I read a lot about the Marine Corps and the things that was going on and that they had done since 1776, and I just said, you know, I'm not messing around with any other service. I'm going for the big guns, so. All right, and why go into the service rather than, would, did you have a prospect to go to college, or would you just gone to work somewhere? I graduated with a general degree and I never had no college thoughts mm -hmm. you know I just I figured I'd just work and then I saw went and talked to the recruiter and decided you know this is where I want to go All so right. we joined okay and you said your friend didn't get in what no he didn't get in but another friend of mine was that I graduated with uh, he did get in so we went in on the buddy system and went to San Diego for our recruit training. Um, got out of San Diego and came home on leave. All right. Well, let's back up here a little bit. Uh, a lot of people these days are not really familiar with what the Marine Corps basic training consisted of. So what kind of reception did you get when you got to San Diego? Uh, if you've ever seen anything on TV, it's, that's it. And can you uh, explain that? Uh, you get you get off an airplane or however you get to California, you get on a cattle car or a bus, and these drill instructors are in your face. I mean, it's, it's dead on. You sit straight, you don't talk, you look straight ahead, you don't scratch, you don't do anything. And if you just turn your eyes, they're, there, they're right there, they watch you. It's, it's discipline, discipline, discipline the whole time. You get off the bus, they're yelling at you. There's five or six that come swarm you. You get off the bus, they got footprints painted all over. You go jump on the footprints, drop all your stuff and stand at attention as best as we know attention, and they will tell you. They'll adjust you uh, till you get it the Marine Corps way. And then for the next, 10 days, I mean, it's nothing but yelling. All the, the 
whole time they're yelling. Marine, the drill instructors do not talk. They yell. Were you expecting that when you went? Yes, because I had seen some things on TV. My brother-in-law at the time was a Marine Corps recruiter in New York, so he, you know, he kind of clued me in on what was going on. So you knew these guys were not completely insane. Oh, yes. That there was a particular thing they were doing. Yes. Uh, now, in general, how well did you adjust to the Marine way of doing things? I enjoyed it because uh, I've always been kind of, I like discipline. I like things in a certain order. And I, I like the discipline. I mean, I got to it right away. It never bothered me because I knew you know, how to take an order. All right. And aside from just learning to, to follow orders and so forth, what other kind of training were you getting there at that stage? A lot of physical, you know, of course. Um, you get up in the morning and uh, triple S and you're out the door, you know, uh, standing on line and then you start calisthenics for a while. You, uh, They start out fairly slow to get people adjusted to it uh, but then a lot of running a lot of heavy lifting and things it's all to break you down and then build you up mm -hmm. uh, mentally and physically right uh, now were you in pretty good physical shape when you went in yeah I was because I was uh, on the gymnastics team the cross-country team in high school so I was in pretty good shape yeah, that and throwing a few beer kegs around, it probably. Well, did. I did a lot of that too. Yeah, yeah probably. Good. In general, what kind of people were there along with you? People from every walk of life. Uh, we had people from New York, with Chicago, California. Of course, you know the they stood out because they were sunshine boys. You know, they all glamour guys. It seemed uh, a lot of Midwest farmers. I mean people that were uneducated, people that had college already. You know, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Okay. And was there a certain, an ethnic mix to it? Were there blacks? And oh, yeah. We had uh, black, white, Mexican. Uh, I think there was a couple Japanese. Uh, yeah, it was just a mixture. All right. And did most of them get through the training in one piece, or did people bounce out. Oh, we, out. we lost a few. I can't remember exactly how many we started out with, but we lost a few through, you know, they couldn't take uh, the physical part of it and they'd fall out. Some of them couldn't take the mental part and they'd fall out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, some of them just absolutely didn't like it. So, you know, they'd do anything they could to get out. And, now, at this stage, was the Marine Corps in a position where they could still be a little bit pickier than they were going to be later? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Marine Corps was a, back then, it was an elite group. There was probably less than 50,000 people in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And so they could be pretty selective at that time. Right. Okay. Uh, so you go through. So how long is the basic training then? Thirteen weeks. Everything in the Marine Corps seems to be thirteen. Okay. Uh, now, did you go to advanced training before you got leave to go home, or did you go home just after 13 weeks? Uh, after after boot camp, we did. We went to um, they call it ITR in, infantry training regiment in Camp Pendleton, but then we left right from there and went home for a few days. Okay. Now, how was the infantry training at Camp Pendleton different from boot camp? Uh, it's a lot more physical. Um, you're carrying packs because they're, you know, getting you set for to carry things. Plus, you know, the uh, rifle, uh, taking instant orders and, and acting instantly um, in bad situations, you know, where somebody's shooting at you. Yeah. Now, at this stage in your career, were you still just basically an ordinary foot soldier, or were you going to get training for more specialized duty? Um, I knew that I had signed up for the uh, air wing, which was working on either fixed wing or helicopters, and I knew that schooling was coming. So, you know, after um, ITR, the infantry training, we knew we were going to a different school. Okay. But in the meantime, you were getting the same infantry training as everybody oh, else. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, all Marines are riflemen. 
doesn't doesn't matter clerk cook doesn't matter you're all riflemen all right and what kinds of weapons were you training on at that point um, the M14 at that time is what we had. Uh, we started out carrying the M1 carbine. Uh, we never did shoot that. You just carry it. Um, but then they switched over afterwards to the M14, and uh, we got later into the 45. Mm -hmm. uh, but did you work with machine guns or mortars or things like that too? We got to shoot each one of those they just they give you the basics if you were um, you know especially the ground troops if they were going on to infantry they would give them more training uh, either on mortars machine guns or BAR whatever it was that they had all right and the people who were doing the training were they combat veterans mostly or just people who've been in the Corps in peacetime or did you not know I really didn't know. Now, I mean, there were some that, you know, um, the little older guys had Korea. Mm -hmm. um, most of them were younger, probably hadn't seen any combat because there really wasn't anything going on there. Right, right. We really hadn't been, en we hadn't been engaged in Vietnam yet, so they're not no. coming back from that yet right. at, at this point. Okay. There were some that were from Vietnam because Vietnam, we had troops there like 1955. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so there had been some that had been advisors. Mm -hmm. or there were some that units, yeah. had been there, but not in a combat situation. So was the combat training still geared for kind of fairly conventional warfare at that point? Yes, it was, yeah. It's um, the same thing that, you know, it probably every service went through, it was all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but not geared specifically toward Vietnam or jungle no. fighting or anything, that kind of thing no. yet? No. Because later on it would be, but not yeah. at that stage. Okay. Uh, so you go through the infantry training. What was it like to go back home again after several months in, in the Corps? I walked a little straighter. I walked a little prouder. Uh, I probably thought I was a little tougher than what I really was. So that was interesting to see some of my friends, you know, that uh, I had competed against in high school. And here I come home in a uniform and Marine Corps, you know, that was Okay. Was, they were impressed. Yeah, uh, it's still kind of early enough where that's mm -hmm. going to be the response, and you can come home in uniform, and it's not mm -hmm. any big deal. Right. All right. Uh, then you go off. Then where do you go then for your next round of training? Uh, after after my leave, I went back to California, Camp Pendleton for ITR. Um, we got out of there, and I went to Millington, Tennessee, Memphis for my. Uh, they call it mech fund, mechanical fundamentals on, on uh, jets. All right. Uh, and how long a training course was that? I really can't remember that. It was probably at least three months because mm -hmm. uh, we went through, <coughs> excuse me, we went through uh, how the aircraft is built and what the, the structures and, and everything, and that was quite a bit on that. Uh, some hydraulics, some electronics, um, seeing as how I was uh, aviation structural mechanic, uh, we got into more of the metal mm -hmm. facets of it. All right. Uh, and what was uh, the daily routine like there as opposed to what it had been you know, with infantry training or something else? Wasn't a whole lot of PT. You know, you might get out and do a half hour of calisthenics or something, but then it was mainly just a school situation. Okay. Did you get much hands-on work? Oh, yeah. Um, after the first couple of weeks, then it was, you were, of course, not right on a jet, because that's what I was going into, was uh, fixed wing. We'd have parts to look at. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, and then... Was the group that you were with a little bit different from the ones you'd been with in the earlier stages of training? Did they have more education or practical experience? Most of them were, had higher education or, you know, at least finished high school. Mm -hmm. um, some of them had some basic metal training. And it was just, uh, just a bunch of, you know, 19-year-old kids right. trying to do something. Okay.
Now, once you've finished that, what's the next step for you? Um, after that, after the school, then we got to go home on leave again, and then we were assigned a base where we were going to go uh, to learn what was going on on uh, all levels of fixed-wing aircraft and uh, like a group situation, you know, hundreds of guys working and doing different jobs. Okay. So where did you get sent then? So after Tennessee, what's the next step? After Tennessee, I've been trying to think of that, and I'll tell you, it's, you know, my mind, I can't remember a lot of the things that went on. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, I just, I can't even remember where I went. Uh, well, was that a long stay or just a couple of months? or That was fairly short because um, uh, September, August to September of 65, I was in California. Okay. Yeah, and uh, at... Uh, Oh, El Toro, okay. and we went, got on the, got on the ship at Long Beach, and went to Vietnam. All right. What was the ride on the ship like? That was like nothing I had ever seen before in my life. You know, I'd watched the thing. My father was in World War II. He was uh, the Eighth Army Air Wing, or Air Corps, mm -hmm. and when they came home. They came home with their planes and that. It's the first time I had ever seen a ship that big with that many people on it. Uh, Twenty guys in a room like my bedroom. Mm -hmm. You had beds that were this far apart, stacked wall to, I mean, floor to ceiling, and bulkhead to bulkhead. It was it's just... I'm, Close quarters, very hot, just chaos to me. All right. And did people get seasick on top of that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Fortunately, you know, I grew up in a fishing family, so it never bothered me. Mm -hmm. And I'd been uh, growing up near Muskegon. I'd been on Lake Michigan, Muskegon Lake. And so storms, that never bothered me. But I watched a lot of guys over the rail. Mm-hmm. All right. About how long did that trip take? That took 30 days. We were on the USS Princeton, an LPH-5, which was carrying uh, helicopters and jets. Uh, I can't remember how long this ship is, but you could run around it in about three minutes. Uh, we did a lot of that. Uh, we got a. We ran into a big storm out in the middle of the ocean and. Uh, I mean, it was, we were going up and down 60 feet. And it's, I mean, it, it was a lot, and a lot of people getting sick. All right. Did you stop off any place on the way? We stopped in Hawaii. Uh, we got in there early in the morning. I can remember coming around, I think that's Diamond Head, mm -hmm. coming into the port in Hawaii, and I'd say, oh, boy, this is nice, man. We're going to get some leave in Hawaii. I said, oh, all right. They wouldn't let us off the base. So we did get to go off the ship and walk around in the docks for while they refueled, took on more food. And we were standing watching them load the ships, and they're loading on live ammunition. And everybody's saying, what's this for? Because they had told us that we were going on an exercise. And uh, when they start taking on live ammo, everybody's thinking, what, what is this? Of course, there are some guys that were smarter than others, and uh, they kind of figured that we were going to Vietnam, but they didn't tell us that until the two days out of Hawaii. Then right. they told us we were going to Vietnam. Now, was Vietnam the next stop, or did you stop in Vietnam else? was the next stop. Okay. And where did you land? We landed just off of Chulai. Um, we went off the ship in helicopters. We bail out of the helicopter and 
set up what they call a hasty perimeter uh, for defense because we were all thinking, you know, we're going to be getting shot at and all this. So, and, you know, 19-year-old kids, you know, we just, we jumped off and everybody's aiming their rifles and all this. And uh, we looked up and here's a CB um, sitting on his bulldozer just, <laughs> just laughing at us because, you know, he's out there with no shirt and enjoying the sun and watching these dumb Marines come off the helicopters and thinking they're going to be getting into a battle. So there were some people there before you were? Oh, yes. Yeah, we were one of the first air units to go in, uh, probably the first big influx of Marines to go into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then what did you do once you got there? Uh, once we got there, the first thing they did is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, once we got everybody off the ship and all our gear and everything, uh, first thing is you got to set up a perimeter for guard duty. And, of course, that's the first thing I got was being on guard duty because they didn't have anything built yet to start working on the aircraft. And we only had a few aircraft there at that time. Uh, so, you know, we just got in our fire teams, which is four guys, usually a lance corporal, corporal, and then three lesser people to run a fire team. And they set us on a bunker line. Well, we had to build our own bunkers. Mm -hmm. but fortunately, uh, we ran into a CB and kind of made friends with this guy and gave him a, some cigarettes or something and he took his big bulldozer and <laughs> dug us out a hole right on this ridge. I mean, it was, it was beautiful. We had, the, we had the best bunker in the whole unit. All right. And then what kind of building materials were you working with? Were just sandbags or metal sheets? A lot of sandbags. Uh, any would go out and cut down palm trees or you know and use them and, and you steal what you can we went in and we got some during the night we'd go in and commandeer some martial matting and so we put it over the hole and then four or five layers of sandbags uh, whatever you could get you 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 that's what you'd use some guys dug it by hand and use rocks and anything else they could get. Now, did you have things like barbed wire and mines and stuff like that as well, or? There was that. Uh, we didn't get into that because that was more or less a specialty. There were guys that were trained on how to use that. Right. Um, call it concertina wire. It comes mm -hmm. in big rolls, but all it is is barbed wire. Right. And uh, they went down on the beach and set those up, and they'd put out uh, mines and pop flares and other things for security. Okay. So there were, were there regular Marine ground troops there? Who there were, were, we had the ground troops, uh, just a very small unit, just for that reason to do those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, now in the area where you were, was there a civilian population there? There was a uh, village not too far from where we were at Chulai. Uh, there was, some rock marines, Korean marines mm -hmm. that were stationed not too far away. Uh, there was a hospital area being built not too far away, a couple miles, I guess. Mm -hmm. But did you have much contact with either the civilians or the Koreans or? No, no contact whatsoever. We were, you know, on 100% alert because they didn't know what, nobody knew what was going on right then. Mm -hmm. Um, so we were on, you know, pretty much 100% alert all the time, and you couldn't go anywhere. There wasn't anywhere to go. There's nothing there. Okay. So there's not really a city or town close no. to where you were or anything else no, like that? No, no, just a little village. All right. Now, uh, did you have any uh, contact with the enemy after you got there? Yeah, we did. Um, of course, we had the probes would come in right away. I mean, the first, the first night we had people coming up close to what wire we had out there. We didn't have a lot that first night. Um, 
I'm thinking it was either the second or third night we were out there, we had some come in and they, I was on my turn for watch. And there, at that time, there was just two guys. You had the fire team, but you had two guys in a hole. Mm -hmm. And that was just a foxhole. And I was on watch. I was looking out and this, the enemy shot one round and it hit right in front of me and kicked pebbles and stuff in my face. Cut my face up a little bit. Not bad, but uh, then everybody just unloaded on that one spot mm -hmm. that they thought where he was, you know. Then uh, the first night, that was just about it. Then, or second night. Then after that, it was intermittent rocket attack or mortar attacks and sniping. Nothing, nothing real serious. Okay. So you didn't get sappers coming in trying to blow things up yet, or no, not like that. Uh, not then, because there wasn't, there really wasn't anything there yet. They hadn't even gotten the uh, tents and stuff set up. The uh, runway, the flight line wasn't even built yet. That was part of our job. During mm -hmm. the day, we'd do that, and then at night, we were on guard duty. All right, so you were actually trying to physically help build a runway at that y point? Yeah, the runway and that, and use but marshal matting, they call it. It's just big 18-foot steel sheets, and they interlock. Uh, of course, the CVs were out there. They leveled the stuff off, and then we went out there and put it down, and they'd, they'd move the stuff around for us. But. Okay, and then how quickly did you get aircraft coming in? It seems like you know, once we got a big enough section, they started bringing stuff in mm -hmm. pretty quickly. It was well, maybe two weeks before we really got the, the birds coming in. Okay. Then once the aircraft started coming in, did your job switch more to actual maintenance work, or were you still doing a lot of guard duty? No, I was still on. I was on guard duty and doing that the whole time I was at July. I, I never did. Uh, Never did work on any of the planes there because they weren't flying any um, operations or anything then. Uh, I was there two, maybe a, two months, and then I got transferred up to Marble Mountain, which was helicopters. All right. Uh, okay, well, tell us about that then. Uh, first of all, where was Marble Mountain? Marble Mountain is three or four miles, I think, from Da Nang. Um, right on the South China Sea, um, that base was already set up when I got there. They already had the martial matting down and the, the, there was helicopters there. Um, so I moved in right there, right into the metal shop, they call it, and, and uh, the, they were doing operations when I got there. So, All right. Uh, and how was sort of life there different from what it had been like in July? It was a little more peaceful. Um, you weren't so on edge all the time. At least I wasn't. Um, you know, we had a place to, a tent, hardback they call them. To, uh, we had a place to live. Uh, mess hall was set up. You had, you know, three meals a day. Um, and you just, just, you just get up in the morning and go do your job. It was just, Pretty much like it was, you know, after Vietnam. You get up, go to work, and you come home. And so this was not an area where you were under rocket attack or mortar attack or things it, like that. There wasn't a lot of that. We did get, you know, we'd get the probes, of course, and uh, we'd get people trying to come in through the wire. And uh, once in a while, there'd be a more two or three mortars come in, but it wasn't was never anything serious until like October. Uh, we got, I think it was October 28th, 29th, uh, 1965, and that's when we had quite a few came in. There was, they, they attacked Marble Mountain, Da Nang, and Chu Lai about the same night. Um, and sappers came in. Uh, we lost 16 aircraft. One corpsman was killed that was sleeping in the aircraft because he was on standby. Uh, and I heard later that it was Tab Hunter, the movie star's brother. I don't know if that for a fact, but um, at that time I was on 
um, uh, what do they call it? Reactionary platoon. So I did my job during the day, uh, and then that night, if anything happened, they'd call us out. Uh, so after after work on the 29th, 28th, whatever night it was, I went to the club like I always did because there's nothing else to do. Um, so you know I'm in there drinking beer and having a good time there, and went to bed and about. One o'clock in the morning, and was, they called us out. Uh, right, mortars were coming in, siren went off, and everybody grabbed your rifle and helmet, bandolier, and go out to do your job. All right. And then what happened with, or what did you see that night? Um, they, we had a place we were supposed to meet, uh, and then they told us where to go. And there was a group. They told us to go up to the flight line because uh, we had them coming in through the north wire. And so we were heading up there, and as soon as I got to the flight line, uh, I saw several helicopters on fire. Uh, of course, stuff's still going off, rounds going off. It's uh, like watching a John Wayne movie. Um, there was three or four of us running up the flight line to go to where we are supposed to go, and uh, one of the rockets that was, I don't know what, how it happened, it was either on the bird or in staging, whatever, but it had lit off and was shooting down, the, I mean, coming at us. Now, I mean, they, we weren't in any danger, I didn't think. I mean, it, it wasn't that far from us or that close to us, but here comes this rocket shooting down the down the runway, I was, it was, you know, with that. then I'm thinking, whoa, what is this? And later we were laughing about it, of course. But, uh, we were running up to our spot, and uh, this one corporal that uh, lived in our tent, Corporal Brule, I remember, he, he was on bunker watch that night. He was yelling at us. He said, there's some over there, there's some over there. And then he opened up with a machine gun. And killed three or four of them. Uh, we ran up to um, our flight line to where we were supposed to meet. And uh, the VMO squadron was up here. Um, that's Huey's. We were, I was in 34s, H-34s. Uh, they've said that they were coming. They'd been through the wire already. Um, so we've got our people out here on bunker watch, but then there's people inside the wire, and uh, they—I don't know how many they'd killed then, but they had killed some of the enemy, and uh, then we got just grabbed up by somebody else and said, "Let's—we're going over here and see what we can see." Um, a lieutenant, oh, I can't remember, he was in a Greenway, Greenwood, something like that. Anyway, he uh, he said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna take some captives, we're gonna take some alive. So you, you, and you go set up here. Well, uh, I jumped, I ran up, and we were on the ground and watching in between the tents. And I looked between these two tents, and there's a VC here, and there's a VC here on this corner of this tent. And I pulled up to shoot him, and the lieutenant says, no, don't shoot him, don't shoot him. Uh, about that time, I saw a little spark from this guy's hand, and something hit me in the shoulder. And rolled down, I looked, and it was a C-ration can grenade. Uh, it looked to me like a C-ration can. Mm -hmm. um, and they had told us some of the things what to, to expect there, so I, I yelled grenade and rolled over, put my head over hands over my head and this thing went off and chewed up my right side a little bit. Nothing nothing serious, mm -hmm. but the pain was unbelievable. Um, my, fortunately, my rifle took the worst of the hit, chewed my stock all to pieces, and we were carrying M14, so it's, you know, it's a pretty good stock. Uh, got me in the right side 
and then they got another guy that was a little ways from me. He took some in the left arm. You know. And did that finish the fight for you? Or did you stay in for a while longer? No, they, I mean, I, I heard somebody yelling for their mother, and I'm thinking, yeah, what a, what a pansy is this guy? And I found out later it was me. Uh, you know, I'd never experienced anything like that. Uh, but they did. They dragged me off, and Corman was right there and, you know, said it's not serious, but threw some bandages on. He said, you stay here. Mm -hmm. And uh, about that time, a uh, captain came up, and he took my rifle, and he went after these guys, I guess. As yeah. far as you know, did they actually capture any of them? Or? Yes, they did. We We did capture two alive, I believe. They killed, I don't know how many that were killed, but uh, I was sitting out the rest of the fight pretty much. Uh, uh, when it was all over, you know, they came and I got my rifle back and uh, my wounds weren't serious. It was in, inside this sea ration can was flints from a lighter. And they were green, so they were Russian flints. Mm -hmm. Plus, there were some other things, but I had a few pieces in me. And it wasn't, I mean, I could walk. I was still yeah. able to move around. Um, they, then we were going out, and then, uh, you know, they sounded the all clear as everything was done with. Of course, it's daylight then. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, then they started gathering up the dead. And uh, we had four or five wounded, I think, is of our guys, and then, of course, that Corman was killed. Uh, but there was there was a boatload of BC, and they were picking them up and putting them on uh, a four-by, which is a big truck. Mm. All right. Now, uh, how quickly were you back on duty after that? Um, they took me from there, put me on a helicopter, and took me to Charlie Med, which was up right near Da Nang, uh, and they, you know, they just took out the pieces that they could and bandaged up stuff and said, okay, you can go back to your unit. So uh, it was a couple, about three miles, I think, we were, started walking back to base. There was a couple of us, and, uh, you know, we got a ride from other units, and they just took us back to base, and then I, when I checked in, then it was just um, work as usual. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have uh, any other incidents there, any other large-scale attacks, or was that really the one kind of crisis point while you were there? That was the big thing. Um, we did have one later on. Um, I was, you know, at like I had said before, all Marines are riflemen, so you do your job during the day, and then at night you're on guard duty, mess duty, other things. Uh, I was on guard duty. You get that about every couple months. You'd get it for anywhere from two weeks to 30 days. Uh, I got, I was on uh, listening post. Um, every third night, I think it was, and there was a another guy, and I can't remember his name. It's been a long time, uh, but this was around December, because uh, I remember some people had Christmas trees and things, and I used to like, really enjoy Christmas. Um, after Christmas of '65, I never liked it again. Didn't want anything to do with Christmas because uh, I really missed being home. But anyway, we were out on listening post, and we had, of course, you have a night vision scope, and, and that would take any heat and magnify it so you could see. They're nothing like they are today, but mm -hmm. back then they call it starlight scope. It was quite scientific back then. Um, we had wires out, and if any vibration would come on, it would light up this board and would tell you where movement was. Didn't, wouldn't tell you what it was, it just say that there was movement. And they had to be, they could put the sensitivity, so they'd put it, you know, like 90, 80, 90 pounds, so they'd figure it would be a human. Well, we had this board, and uh, of course we had a radio that we could radio back with. Well, one night 
our board lit up. And so we called in and said, you know, we got possible movement in the wire at station, and I can't remember what it was, but whatever it was. Well, then another light went on. Pretty soon, the whole board lit up. I mean, it was lit up, and the lights were just flashing. So we knew there was a lot of movement, and uh, they lit a flare, and there was probably 20 people in the wire. They'd already got through the outs uh, outer wire. So the listening post itself was, act was still inside the perimeter of that the wire? Was, that was outside the perimeter of the bunker. Okay. But the wire was still beyond but the wire, you. we had two things of wire beyond that. Mm -hmm. So, but we were the farthest ones out. Yeah. And uh, then it lit up and they called us back. Of course, you're whispering, you know, and they said, keep your head down. They're all over out there. So that's what we did, and there was, you know, shooting maybe a half hour or so. Uh, and when it was over, you know, they, of course, flares are going off the whole time, and if we would have popped our head up, it'd be like that little gopher in those games, pop your head up and somebody's going to stomp on you. So did you just stay hunkered down in we the foxhole? We stayed right down in the bottom, because, yeah. uh, you know, they that's what they told us to do, so we did that. and. Uh, I, I can't remember how long it was, but it, you know, it seemed like it took an awful long time. It probably was no more than 10, 15 mm -hmm. minutes, actually. Uh, but then when we, they sounded the all clear, and of course a lot of flares going off, and when we got up out of the hole, they said, you know, get up and come back to the bunker line. When we did that, there was a VC about 10 feet from us that had been shot. So he was close to us. and. You know, fortunately, didn't see us. Um, they had they had sapper charges on some of them, but most of them just had those old single shot rifles, and a couple of them just had sticks. Mm -hmm. But they dope them up on opium or whatever it was, and they you know they'd go at us with anything they had. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, when you were doing your actual maintenance or mechanical work. I mean, did you have a lot of sort of battle damage to repair? Did you have a lot of work to do? Yeah, we did. Uh, mainly it was patching bullet holes because, uh, you know, helicopters and the 34s are a slow flying thing. Uh, and 95% of the bullet holes were in the bottom. Uh, so all, what you do is you just drill out that hole, make it, make it bigger, and all depend on where it was on the helicopter. You either just put a patch over it or put a flush plat patch, which is you make the hole bigger, put a piece that fits inside that hole, and then put a piece over that and one on the inside and rivet them together. So. Now, were you losing a lot of uh, helicopters shot down or completely disabled? Or No. Uh, you know, we, we, we did. We had a couple that were shot down and lost, uh, but I, I don't think there was that many. You know, after that initial, we lost 16 helicopters that in October. Mm -hmm. um, after that, you know, I can't remember losing, but maybe one or two that crashed. But did those 16 get replaced pretty quickly, or did yeah, it was uh, it was just a day or two, and we had them come in because they had them stacked up at uh, Da Nang. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did you get to go fly on the helicopters yourself? Once in a while, um, I'd just go on a like a mail run or a test flight or something. I was never a crew chief or mm -hmm. anything like that. But then, well, once in a while, we got to fly in. All right. Now, uh, at Marble Mountain, did they have any Vietnamese, either civilian or military personnel there? Oh, yeah. We had quite a few. They worked in the mess hall. They worked in the laundry, the barber shop. Um, we had them doing a lot of things. Um, <laughs> they'd work for us during the day, and at night, some of them were VC sympathizers, and they, uh, they, w we did have our barber would cut hair during the day, and at night, he'd come in with some others and, and mark trails, and they had little trails through the wire. Now, did he get caught at some point? He was caught, and they, he was shot. 
and killed, and then he, he died up in our water tower. Um, they didn't find him for two days, but they found he was dead up in the water tower, and, you know, of course, then they had to drain it and mm -hmm. clean it and start over again. Now, did they give you much by way of sort of security warnings or tell you what you should or shouldn't say around the Vietnamese people who came through? Or uh, We got the Vietnamese etiquette um, on board ship. They'd tell us, you know, you don't touch them on the head. Um, you don't, when you're sitting, you don't cross your legs and point the sole of your feet at them because that was, the sole of your feet is the closest thing to the devil. and if you did that, you were, you know, evidently wishing the devil on them. And if you touched them on the head, you know, the little kids, you weren't supposed to do that to little kids because that was closest to Buddha. Mm -hmm. and so you were sending you, them that way too so soon. You, yeah. And, uh, uh, but in terms of just warning you about how some of these people may be VC sympathizers or be careful what you say around them or anything like that. Oh yeah, it's you know that old thing of back in World War One or Two, whatever you know, loose lips sink ships. That that old saying that they'd throw that at us a lot, but uh, you didn't you didn't know because they all looked the same. I mean, <coughs> you know, it was we had some that were worked for us in the day and we'd shoot them at night and I mean that happened not every night but I mean you know there was that, that happened a bit. Okay. Now did you have any Vietnamese military personnel working with you? We did um, on some of our uh, we'd go out on patrols I, I got to go on a few patrols we'd go down to the orphanage that, that was down the beach from us a few miles uh, and we'd have a uh, either South Vietnamese military personnel with us or Kit Carson scout. And Kit Carson scouts were North Vietnamese that, or you know, Viet Cong mm -hmm. that had been captured and retrained, repatriated, mm -hmm. whatever they call it. Yeah. And then they'd work for us. And uh, you know, a lot of them hated the North Vietnamese. So. Now, while you're there, did you have um, much of a sense of the, the larger political picture of what was going on, or were you just kind of there to do a job and do what they told you? Um, I pretty much I was there to do what I was told to do and get back home. You know. And what impression did you have of your enemy at that point? What did you think of them? Kill him before he killed us, mm -hmm. and you know uh, that was that was pretty much it. All right. Now, about how long then did you stay at Marble Mountain? I was probably at Marble Mountain about ten months. Okay. Now, during that time, did you get uh, any leave time or R and R or anything like that? I was. Yeah, I did. I was. Um, I got my R and R, which is rest and relaxation, but uh, that's not what we call. We call it I and I, but. Um, I had picked Hong Kong, and so I got to go to Hong Kong for five days, and that was inebriation for five days. That's what that was. <laughs> and then, uh, what was it like to go back after that? It's like coming back home. You know, I mean, I I felt comfortable in that combat situation mm -hmm. you know it, um, when we were in Hong Kong uh, you, when I would sober up I I was afraid I'd always look you know I'd, I'd go into a when I was sober in the first thing in the morning I'd go into a bar I'd, I'd walk in off the street and immediately go left or right put my back against the wall and wait until my eyes adjusted before I went in and then I would sit against the wall t so I could see the doors. All right, so you'd absorbed a certain amount oh, yeah. of what you kind of had yeah. to do to, to survive where, where you mm -hmm. were. Uh, now, in general, how would you characterize the morale on the base while you were there? We were pretty much gung-ho. Uh, 
You know, everybody knew they had a job to do. We were told, you know, we're saving Vietnam from communism, uh, and that guys were, you know, ready to do their do their job, and always, you always would watch somebody else's back. You know, that's the one thing that uh, I truly loved about the Marine Corps. Somebody was always watching your back. So that uh, that that was really instilled in me, just even in that short time I was in so far, you know, less than a year. Right. Now, uh, some of the sort of stereotypes about the, the Vietnam experience include issues like racial tensions or drug use or other things like that. Um, was there really much of a discipline problem where you were? Not in the beginning. Uh, after a while, it got to be, because there was a lot of stuff going on back in the States, uh, racial things were going on, so it got to be that way there also. Uh, you know, of course, you got your cliques. Uh, the black guys had their own things, and the white guys would stay over here, and uh, there was there was uh, a lot of racial tension uh, at the towards the end of my first tour. Now, would that boil over in, into fights? Or oh yeah. yeah, yeah. There was fights. There was some stabbings. There were some shootings on, on both sides. Uh, I never got into any of it because I was pretty much, I had some, I don't know, I grew up, went to, went through school my whole time in school with a mix. Yeah, because Muskegon Heights was one of the first Muskegon. places where you had a large black population yes. in that area. Sure. Yeah, and so I grew up in that and I, you know, I just, uh, I never had any problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew some guys that did because they came out of the Midwest or something that didn't have a, a significant black population, mm -hmm. and they, there were some troubles. Uh, now, were there Southern whites there as well? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were, you know, they had the, the rebel flag up, and they were told to take it down. Uh, they took it down from outside, but they had it up inside, and there was a lot, well, there was a lot of that. Uh, some areas, I mean, it's like the base, it's like a little city. I mean, there's some places, you know, like Grand Rapids, there's some places a white person doesn't walk. And there's some places, you know, that black people will kind of shy away from. It was the same there. You didn't go into certain sections of the tent community. How much of an effort did the, the officers or leadership make to try to kind of deal with this and control it? Oh, they tried. They they tried uh, to do a lot of things, but it just never seemed to, nothing ever worked. It was all, the only way you could do it is you try and figure out the ringleaders, the heads of it, and transfer them out. Mm -hmm. And that, that happened quite a bit. Okay. Uh, and were there problems with things like drug use, or was it too early for that yet? Or? I never saw it, but I talked to some people that were there with me, you know, later in years, and you know, and then I found out that there was there was some heavy-duty drug use there. Um, I knew some guys that that did it. Uh, we went, we used to play a lot of cards, and we were playing cards, and these guys are in there smoking marijuana. I didn't know what it was. I. You know, it wasn't anywhere around when I was in school. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what this stuff was, and I didn't, I didn't want anything to do with it. I smoked cigarettes, but, you know, I didn't want that. But, you know, I drank. My mm -hmm. big thing was beer. I love beer. And so I would drink the beer, but you'd, you'd get that contact high in, that, mm -hmm. in the tent. Right. And, you know, it, that was enough for me. Yeah, but I never did any of the, you know, the hard, hard stuff, stuff or right. injections. I never would mm -hmm. do that. So. All right. Uh, now, as you got toward the end of your, your 13 months there, were you kind of counting down the days to get out at that point? Oh, yeah. You get, uh, you get your short-timers calendar after at uh, 100 days left. 
and what these are is just a, a drawing of something. 90% um, of the time it's probably a naked woman and you know and you color in the spots, the, the numbers starting from 99 on down and you know once you once you get down to a few days the shorter you get you know then you come out with a saying I'm I'm so short I've got to climb on a ladder to get to the mess hall or to, you know a lot of silly things and one of the things that went on a lot in Vietnam later on was that they had sort of a regular system of, of troop rotation and guys come and go as individuals. But you had gone in pretty much as a unit initially? Yeah, we did. We went in as a unit, but um, when we got to Chu Lai, then we kind of dispersed and okay. went out to other air stations. Some guys went up to Fubai, you know, Marble Mountain and that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were leaving at the end of our 13 months, we were leaving by ourselves and going back home. All right. Yeah, so you you're, you are all on kind of separate schedules mm -hmm. and things like that. Yes. It's not all of you picking up and going yeah. at, the, at the same time at that point. Did your duties change at all as you got toward the very end of the tour? Did they pull you off of certain things, or did you just keep doing the same thing the whole time? No, they kept us on the same. We were on the same thing. Uh, we'd Some of the guys would say, you know, I'm, I only I got five days left. You know, I don't need to go out on guard duty. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got a limited amount of people, so some guys had to. Uh, two days before I left, I had bunker watch, you know, and, and that was just, I mean, it, that was my job, so right. I did it. Now, were you having new men transfer in while you were there? So Yeah, that was, it was constant. There'd be people going and people coming um, all the time. And did you have a responsibility to help orient the new men and things like that? Was that part of what you did, or...? Uh, it, not so much because we are in our in the metal shop. You know, we were a pretty close knit group. Uh, all of us had just about the same amount of time. So when one guy left, you know, it wasn't very long. Was that you know somebody else would come in and somebody else would leave. So it yeah that changed. But I didn't really see that because mm -hmm. I was one of the first ones right. to go. Right. So. Okay. Uh, now, once you uh, do finish that tour, then where do you get sent? Uh, they sent me back to the States. I got in California, and they said, you got 30 days leave, you know, um, and then you report to your next duty station. Well, mine was going to be Cherry Point, North Carolina, uh, fixed wing aircraft. And so I went back to Muskegon for my leave. and. Uh, I left early. I didn't stay my whole 30 days. I left. I couldn't. I couldn't take that undisciplined life. You know, it was just. It was too hard on me. Uh, uh, it was a real shock when I got. When I when I left California, it was you know, beautiful California, short sleeve shirts. Mm -hmm. I just had on my short sleeve uniform. Got to Chicago and in the middle of a blizzard. And I've got on my green uniform uh, the wool pants, but, you know, just a cotton short sleeve mm -hmm. shirt, and it's cold, and that's about all I've really got. Uh, fortunately, I had my big, heavy horse coat in the bottom of my sea bag, so mm -hmm. I did dig that out in Chicago. Um, flew into Muskegon. Uh, got off the plane in Muskegon, and it's, you know, it's not too bad. Uh, it was cold, but didn't have a whole lot of snow. Uh, and it was early in the morning, like 5 o'clock or something like that in the morning. And I called a cab, you know, to go home. I didn't want to bother my parents. They didn't know I was coming home. I called them when I was in California and said, I'll be home when I get there, because you know I was I was having a hard time adjusting to civilian life or not civilian life, but not in a combat situation. I was having a hard time. Uh, <coughs> uh, I got off the plane, called a cab, and uh, I'm standing out there outside waiting for the cab. And he pulled up, and I'm in my uniform, and he flipped me the bird and drove off. 
He, so he was a Vietnam protester. And that's only like 1966. That was point. 1966. All right. Uh, so I said, well, <laughs> you know, I guess I'll walk. So I just started walking. And from where I live, I lived on the north side of Mona Lake, and the airport is on the south side of Mona Lake. And it's probably maybe three mile, four miles around. So I just started walking home. I walked out to uh, the main road, which is airport road, and some guy was coming by and stopped and gave me a ride mm -hmm. and took me right to my house. So uh, kind of balanced out the cab driver yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it was an older guy. He was going to work, you know, and he, I can't even remember now our conversation or anything, but uh, he took me right to my house and uh, I got out of his car, you know, and thanked him for the ride and walked up and looked. I was standing in the middle of the road looking at my house and the drapes opened up and there's my mother standing in the window. <laughs> and of course then, you know, it's everybody get up, David's home. You know. So that was pretty nice. All right. But you weren't all that comfortable staying there then once you no. were there? No. Uh, I loved my family, you know, and I missed them the time I was gone, but I also loved my brothers still in Nam, and I didn't want to leave them in that situation. So I was having a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, I felt guilty about leaving. And I've talked to a lot of guys since, and a, a lot of guys had that. They felt guilty about leaving Nam. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, and after the first couple days of seeing family and friends and that, then I kind of got back into go to the bar at night. Mm -hmm. VFW, of course, you know, you'd have to go to the club with my dad. He belonged to the Muskegon Heights Eagles, so I had to do that and mm -hmm. do that route. And the VFWs, everybody had things that, uh, you know, for, for vets, you could go in and get a couple free beers. And so I did all that. Mm -hmm. But I hung around a lot with my friends, too, and did a lot of drinking and would uh, search out to non-vets, and that's the only people that I would really talk to. Of course, you didn't, you didn't say anything to anybody else about anything that happened in Nam. Uh, they, they just didn't understand it, or they were against what you did even back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was worse the second time I came back. But in 66, you know, there was still, there was a lot of protesters and baby killers talk. And, mm -hmm. uh, even then, you know, uh, it got worse in 68, 69, sure. but it was bad enough in 66. All right. So you were not entirely comfortable back in civilian life. And did you still have a lot of the reflexes from being in Oh, the yeah. Home? I did any t anywhere we went, you know, I'd going from a from sunlight into a building I still I'd walk in and I'd go left or right mm -hmm. and put my back to the wall and, and stay there until my eyes adjusted it didn't matter where I went I did it my my grandparents my dad's folks lived two blocks from us I went up to them and when I walked into their garage I stood in the garage until my eyes adjusted and my grandma's stand up there what's the matter mm -hmm. Uh, I said, I'm just waiting for my eyes to adjust, Grandma. You know, I, I had nothing to fear. Right. But in the back of your mind, it was there. So how early did you wind up uh, going back then? Um, this was 1966. I went to Cherry Point, North Carolina, uh, working on, uh, we started out with uh, A4s. And after about, three or four weeks, then they brought in the A6s to us, which was the new... Kind of ground attack aircraft. They were, yeah, they were a, a bomber mm -hmm. type aircraft. Um, that was 1966. Uh, I met a girl there and we got, we were married in 68. Uh, then I re-enlisted. Uh, she didn't want me to, but I said, yeah, it's a, you know, I love the Marine Corps. So we re-enlisted in 1968, and I got 
transferred from there, I was hoping to stay at Cherry Point because mm -hmm. I mean I did like North Carolina because I'm a big, I love fishing and hunting and there mm -hmm. was a lot of fishing there so I liked that. Uh, I got transferred to California and we got out to California and we were there, oh it wasn't, wasn't long, just two, three months and they cut our orders. The unit was going back to Vietnam. Um, I was in a fixed wing out there and uh, I found out my wife was pregnant mm -hmm. and they sent me, I, I brought her back to North Carolina and, and I flew back out to California and uh, we got loaded the ship up and away we went. All right. And where do they uh, send you to in Vietnam this time? I went right back to Chu Lai. Um, we put all our stuff on board the ship and they, they left off. Well, I was, they kept three or four of us, they kept us back to finish up packing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we, we flew over in a, a Big Mac, big plane huge plane. We had, you know, all our gear and everything in there. And was there it a military transport? It's a military aircraft? transport. Okay. Uh, almost like C-5 Galaxy. I mean, mm -hmm. just this thing is, it was big. This might be three quarters the size of a C-5, mm -hmm. but it's a, it was a big ship, big plane. Uh, there was three or four of us in there, and we flew from California to some other spot in, in on the west coast. I can't remember now where it was, but we refueled or picked up some more stuff or something. Then we flew to Guam and refueled in Guam. And uh, of course it was an Air Force base, so we ate very well. Uh, the Air Force eats good. Now, we weren't there very long, uh, maybe four or five hours, just long enough to take on fuel and whatever else we had and then we flew from there uh, right into Chu Lai. All right. Now was Chu Lai a different place this time? Chu Lai was, was like, like it was when I came back home to Muskegon after you know several years. The change was amazing. Here's this, it was a metropolis. I mean you know it looked like a regular, it looked like Gerald R. Ford Airport. You got a big flight line, big buildings everywhere, and then behind them, then you're in the the tents. And but it was it was huge uh, coming over it. Of course, I was there before there was anything there mm -hmm. um, in '65, and here I am back there again in '69, and seeing it from the air, I'm thinking, "Wow, this is amazing! Look at all this stuff." Well, we landed and uh, getting out of the plane and there were some new guys on the plane. I guess we'd pick them up somewhere, three, four new guys. And uh, they got off and of course, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Platoon, uh, you see that, see the guys marching out and Charlie Sheen's coming in and these other guys that have been there going out in that thousand yards stare, you know, I mean, you see that. And the smell it's, you don't forget that smell. I mean, it, I smelled it in 65 and think, wow, what is this? But the whole country smelled like that. And it was, it just smelled like garbage. Mm -hmm. Smelled like a landfill. The whole country smells like that. And except my, probably some of the bigger cities is pretty nice. But uh, that just, when I got off the plane, that hit me again, you know, and I, and then it was, it was back. Right. And it felt okay. The heat and humidity, uh, you take that first breath after that air conditioning and <gasps> that catches you. Um, these new guys got off the plane and they're all wide-eyed looking all around. Well, then we had, a, there was a rocket attack right when we got off the plane and they were coming, it was coming down the runway. And there was two or three rockets that hit 
and you know I was old hat I was a salt I'd been there so it didn't bother me mm -hmm. I'm just standing there watching the rockets and some people are running toward for the bunkers and I look up and here's the captain from uh, California saying by then I'm a, I was a sergeant so he said sergeant Christian come on over here so he had some he had a six-pack so we're sitting there drinking beer watching the rocket mm -hmm. attack and watching all the other people scurry around and yeah you know, it's it happened almost every day they'd rocket the runway after a plane would come in or before it would take off mm -hmm. and they never they hardly ever hit anything I mean that's kind of harassment fire yeah it was harassment and interdiction they call it mm -hmm. right now uh, this time around were your duties largely just working on the aircraft now yep I was uh, higher in rank so I was in charge of the metal shop now instead of you know, I I told people what to do mm -hmm. instead of them telling me. But I still had my other duties. I I was uh, now as a sergeant, so I was in charge of the bunker line instead of just being on watch. Uh, but I'd do my job during the day, and at night I'd go out to the bunker line and and do what I was supposed to do out there. But they're still using men from the metal shop and other kind of service. Oh, yeah, they're still, still using them. Yep, you line. still had, everybody had uh, not only their main job, but you also had something else. Um, if you weren't on mess duty, and that's, I don't care how long you're in the Marine Corps, you're going to, you're going to still get messed, until you get up higher in mm -hmm. rank, but uh, you're still going to have other jobs to do. Okay. I guess one of the, another kind of thing that gets said a lot about Vietnam is, that, you know, for every, every guy who was out there actually in a line unit fighting. You've got 15 or 20 or whatever doing other stuff. Uh, but the division between the grunts who were out there all the time on the ground and everybody else is not always that simple. If, no. you're, if you're pulling guard duty on a regular basis and you're manning a perimeter and things like that, you encounter some of the same things. Right. Not, not the physical wear and tear right. that you get from stomping around through the jungle yep. the whole time. Yeah. But still, a fair amount of that stuff. Oh fun. yeah, yeah. We had, you know, we'd go on uh, patrols every now and then, uh, but uh, we did a lot of. They were back in '69 and '70. They were doing a lot of this, um, uh, trying to help. You know, instead of just flat out trying to kill right and so we'd go into villages and we'd go on these medical mm -hmm. things the, the doctor would go in and help some of the people but then <coughs> the ones on patrol we'd have to you know set up a perimeter and we're just like guard duty but mm -hmm. we got to go something it was there was you know we never encountered any main line forces or mm -hmm. anything we'd get a little sniper or something or going down the trail find a, a booby trap but it was it was not like the guys from the bush mm -hmm. uh, I talked to quite a few after I got out of the Marine Corps I joined the Vietnam Veterans of America chapter in Muskegon and then I got to talk you know to a lot of guys that their 13 months was in the bush mm -hmm. uh, and I mean that's that's horrible. Platoon, the movie Platoon is the closest you're ever going to get to real. It was that was so close, and you know since then they've come out with Saving Private Ryan and uh, Full Metal Jacket, and those are they're close, but Platoon was right on. In terms of sort of the, the physical conditions and circumstances mm -hmm. and that the, kind of the, thing? Yeah, everything, yeah, the mm -hmm. whole aspect of it. Uh, platoon was real. They had a special screening for Vietnam vets at the Michigan Theater in Muskegon. And some of the guys, I didn't see the whole thing. I had to leave. But some of the guys, after the first 10 minutes, were gone. I think I lasted about a half hour. And I just, I had to get out of there because all that stuff just mm -hmm. came back. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it's also a, it's a film with a fairly strong political message, and you sure. wind up with the fighting between the sergeants and killing each other and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. There's a fair number of Vietnam veterans who really don't like that movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot of them that, you know, absolutely refuse to see it and probably haven't seen it yet today mm -hmm. uh, because they were so much against what went on over there. But on the other side of it, there are also some who think it's sort of an unfair depiction or characterization oh, sure of it is. Uh, the soldiers and all the rest of that kind of thing, sure. too. And so there's that, that side of that as well. Mm -hmm. But the part of it, though, that, that, that you, you saw, they, as far as you can tell, they, they basically got it right. Oh, they got it right. Mm -hmm. They hit that right. Um, Oliver Stone got that right on the money. All right. Uh, now, your physical circumstances at, at July at this point now are, are relatively good. Mm -hmm. got a build, were you living in tents at this point? or uh, We had what they call hardback tents. Yeah, it was still the same thing, but they'd have, you know, a metal roof. Mm -hmm. uh, sides, you had mosquito netting all the way around it. Um, we had, <coughs> excuse me, um, the tent that I was in, we had uh, an old parachute because we had you know, a mixed group in our tent. There was seven or eight of us, um, corporal, sergeant, and there was some that worked in the paraloft, some that worked in supply. So we had, you know, we ours was pretty nice. We had an old tent, I mean an old parachute up on the roof. Uh, we had three or four fans, so we had air moving. We had a refrigerator. Uh, we had a TV. We went out and uh, requisitioned a bar that was made for the first sergeant. Uh, nice burnt wood mm -hmm. with naga hide rails. We had that in there. We stole that. Uh, put that in. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had two refrigerators. One was all beer and then the other one was liquor and sodas. Uh, uh, so that was pretty nice, you know. You instead of having to go to the club, you know, we just go to our own tent and watch TV and you know old reruns of Batman. Well, not reruns, but Batman. Yeah, in, in those days, not yeah. so much a rerun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you had so the armed forces provided television or our armed forces radio had you know had the TV and uh, uh, radio and some a lot of a lot of programming. So I couldn't think there'd be a whole lot of Vietnamese programming to watch. No, no, no I, I don't ever remember watching anything. I don't even know if they had anything. Maybe not by true lie anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, now, aside from the fact that the base was now just a, a lot bigger, uh, what else was different about being at true lie the second time from the first? I mean, you're, you're in a better position than you were. Uh, in terms of just what was going on, what kinds of missions were being flown or anything else like that? Um, they did a lot of sorties. Um, you know, we were, uh, what was it we had then? F-8s, maybe, I think. F-9s. Phantom jets. Mm -hmm. um, so they did a lot of bombing runs and they, you know, all over. And mostly when they'd come back, they'd were too damaged to, for us to mess with, so we'd get them enough to where they could either fly or crane them out, whatever it was, aboard a ship, and then they'd take them somewhere else and have them fixed. But uh, we would, uh, I can remember a couple times putting in uh, new supports for the strut, because when they'd come in and land, you know, they'd be a hard landing or something. Uh, that was mainly it. Not a whole lot of bullet holes mm -hmm. this time. Uh, but when they were, they were big because, you know, anti-aircraft fire, or big guns. Mm -hmm. um, but mainly it, it would be structural damage, not bullet holes. Right. Uh, now, did you have, this time around, did you have a lot more sort of Vietnamese people on the base than you had the first time? Or? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, there was, you know, it was like a little city there. Mm -hmm. um, you could go... They had a PX then. You could go in, and it was fairly large. 
um, and all kinds of stuff that you could buy. Plus, there was a, a little cafeteria all the time where you could go in and get things you wanted. Of course, there's the clubs, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so you had beer, and you could get whatever you wanted. They had a barber shop. Uh, uh, there was quite a bit, and you could walk around in relative safety. And mm -hmm. um, there was th there was some things to do um, at night. You'd have the outdoor theater. Uh, you get popcorn, just you know, like this, and you're sitting on the beach, all relaxed, watching a movie. I mean, it was right. And you're not in this phase getting zapper attacks or things like that. Not at July that I can remember. You know, it was mainly rockets and mortars, mm -hmm. and mo mainly rockets because um, July there's it was a long ways from the mountains, mm -hmm. uh, so they used rockets, and uh, that was mainly it. But usually it'd be four or five rockets, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, it just because they'd only have to, they once they light off the first one, because we had spotters all around the place, and they'd spot them, and right away we'd have outgoing fire. They'd call in support from uh, South China Sea, plus they'd, you know, planes would fly off, mm -hmm. and they'd go out, and so they'd only do two or three shots, and that was it. They'd quit. All right. Uh, now, was the morale situation different than it was before? Or was it pretty much like it was when you've been at Marble Mountain at the end, or probably pretty much the same. Um, you know, you still had the cliques, mm -hmm. um, and there was still some racial tension. But on the main part, uh, everybody seemed to get along. It was, you know, just everybody knew you just you're there to do a job and do your time and get up, get out. Mm -hmm. And was there a sense among most of the personnel that it was important to do the job well? Or would that vary? That would vary. Um, you know, some guys, uh, I wasn't, I'm not a real political person, so, you know, I'd looked at it, this is my job, I'm here to do the job as best I can and get out. That's how I was raised. You do a job the best you can with what you have. And that's what I did. I tried to do the best I could with what I had, with what time I had left to do it in. Uh, there were some guys that were political. They, they said, you know, I'm not picking up a weapon. I don't care what they say. And you know, I'd, get, I'd say, what if he's got one pointed at you? What are you going to do? Are you going to shoot him or are you going to take it? Well, I guess I'll get shot. I said, well, I guess you will because, you know, I'm... If you're that stupid, take it. You know, so I wouldn't do that. Would those guys resist doing guard duty or things oh like yeah. that? Oh, yeah. When we had guys go to LBJ, Long Ben Jail, mm -hmm. you know, for, you know, they'd refuse to pick up their weapon. Uh, some of them would go on guard duty, but they wouldn't pull their post. So whoever was in charge, you know, I had to write up a couple guys. So, And they got busted, sent to jail. But... I, that's that was part of it. All right. Uh, now, did you spend the whole second tour at Chulai, or did you go anywhere else? We were in Chulai for about six or seven months, and in uh, seven days they were starting the pullout, and we were we were one of the first air units to go in, so we were one of the first to leave. So they sent us to Iwakuni, Japan, um, as a unit. Um, I was on the forward unit, so I went there probably a month ahead of everybody else to get help get things set up. All right. And what part of Japan is Iwakuni in? Or? Iwakuni is in Honshu, Kenshu province. Okay. So Han Honshu is the main island? Honshu is the main island. Yeah. Uh, we were south of Hiroshima, probably 100 miles mm -hmm. south, I guess. I mean, okay. I'd so fairly yeah. far south on the island, yeah. south of Tokyo and mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, what kind of facility was there? It's all barracks. It's like any Marine Corps base. You know, it was hardcore barracks, uh, uh, big flight cement flight line, concrete flight line. You had um, big rooms for the, the shop, so it was all set up. And it was It was pretty nice. We had a big metal shop, and everything was... Everything we needed was there. 
And then what kind of work did you have to do there? It was mainly going to be the same thing. We'd Any planes that couldn't be fixed in Vietnam, they would send to us and we'd uh, pull the, do whatever we had to do to get them back over to Vietnam. So you were doing the things that you couldn't do back at Chu Lai? Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, because we had, you know, Chu Lai, we didn't have a lot of the big things that we needed to bend the metal. We'd do it with, we had small breaks, they call it, uh, it bends metal. Um, Japan, we'd have, we had three or four different breaks and some, you know, um, hydraulically operated so to bend the, bend the heavy metals to make struts or um, frames, whatever it was. And what was it like to be outside of a combat zone again? That, that took me some adjusting, you know, to not listening for the warnings uh, all the time I was in Nam, I, if you ever watch MASH, you know, radar always knew something was going on before anybody else. I knew when something was coming in most of the time before anybody else. Just something that I could hear, sense, whatever it was. Uh, I was always on alert, always on guard, listening for something, um, watching. I'd always look down at my feet when I'd walk anywhere looking for booby traps. Uh, and I never spent that much time in the bush, but when I did, I w I'd focus in front of me. So, I mean, I'd st I still had that. Right. Uh, did you pretty much spend all your time in the base, or did you get out? Oh, no, I, no, I, you know, uh, whatever, eight to, 4.30, whatever time my shift was, I don't remember that now, but back to the barracks, take a shower, civilian clothes, hit the town. Uh, Iwakuni, there's, on the, coming off the main gate, there's bars on both sides of the road, and I'd hit them all until I found one that I really liked, you know, and then I started going to that one, but I went to probably every bar in Iwakuni. On the most part, they uh, really enjoyed us being there. They were, you know, always polite. Uh, there were some that, you know, didn't want us there. Uh, they'd be outside the gate or the gate and the fence line with signs, you know, American go home. And, uh, but I can't ever remember any physical confrontations or anything with the Japanese. They were just, they were very gracious people. I enjoyed it. And did the uh, Marines uh, sort of send out MPs or whatever to kind of make sure the servicemen behaved? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had, uh, we had uh, MPs, we had Navy shore patrol, mm -hmm. plus we'd have Marines. Um, I pulled MP duty a while when I was in Japan. Uh, and, you know, you walk around and you just, you know, the kind of just corral the drunks and get make sure they get back to base, okay. Um, we had to break up a few fights. And then there's just the regular, you know, we were cops. Uh, that's all it was. Peacekeepers mainly. And then how long did you stay in Japan? We were in Japan for the rest of our 13 month tour and that was either six or seven months. I can't remember now exactly, but uh, then uh, when we left Japan, that was in 1970, and I went, I went to uh, oh, New River, North Carolina, um, right next to Jacksonville, Camp Lejeune. I was at the air, air station there and worked on uh, would we have? I think we had. There was air. There was helicopters and fixed wing there. And were you able to make that adjustment fairly easily, or? <coughs> yeah, I did. Uh, I got back with you know. I, I was married, and uh, we'd had. My son was born when I was in Vietnam. So, you know, he wasn't quite a year old. 
uh, almost a year old, uh, and got back. You know, we we uh, bought a instead of living on base, we bought a mobile home and lived in that. Uh, and it was then it was you know just like a nine to five job. I I did my job, come home, family life. And were there a kind of a group of men working with you on base who all gone through Vietnam by then? Or how did that work? There weren't a lot. There weren't a lot of non vets. Um, there were. You know the older ones were. Um, I was a I was a sergeant, and my staff sergeant had been to Vietnam. The gunnery sergeant, first sergeant, they'd all been to Vietnam. But a lot of the younger guys hadn't been anywhere yet. They were, you know, most of them had been in the Marine Corps less than two years, so they hadn't been there yet. And did you feel like there was kind of a gap or a separation between the ones who'd been there? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, yeah, non vets knew each other. You know, and even today I can walk down the street and I can I can tell pretty much all the time if somebody's been to Nam or not. And it's just a it's just a brotherhood. You know, we know who we know who our brothers are. Uh, now how long then did you stay there? No, I stayed there until 1972, and then they um, sent me to drill instructor school um, down at Paris Island, South Carolina. You know, I went through drill instructor school and made it through that and worked three or four platoons at Paris Island before I was relieved of duty. Uh, and was that, was, was it fine with you at that point to be relieved of duty, or did you want to stay in longer? Or? Oh, I wanted to, I wanted to stay. I loved drill instructor. I, I loved it. I mean, you know, you've got your power. You're the boss of everything. Uh, that was, that was an experience. You know, I hated my drill instructor when I was going through boot camp. Um, he was relieved of duty. He got in malpractice, you know. He, done. he and a uh, couple, couple of them got, for, you know, force. They were so they were relieved. So there, it was uh, possible for a drill instructor to go over the limit. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Um, this was before uh, you could, you could hit them, um, and you could get in their face and yell at them and call them names and all that. That was all part of it because it, that's the thing, you know, you you take somebody out of civilian life and you change them completely, physically and mentally. And, you know, some of them, of course, when, when I went in, it was mainly high school kids or hadn't finished high school. When I was a drill instructor, there was a lot of the guys were sh or uh, college people, and so they knew what was happening. Uh, so they had things figured out. They knew why the drill instructors were doing some things, calling them names, um, yelling. They they knew all about it. So, you know, they had they had a heads up on when I was a dr uh, recruit. Uh, now, were you a kinder, gentler drill, drill sergeant than the ones that you had, or did you do pretty no. much the same thing they did? No. I was much more physical than ours was. Uh, when my, my first platoon that I worked, of course, I was a junior drill instructor. We had a senior drill instructor. He was a staff sergeant, and he said, you know, what, what we're going to do is each of you guys pick out the biggest guy you can see and you beat him down. And then, you know, I, I was in great shape and I could. I was, I was strong. I knew a lot of things. I could, I could take somebody down. And so I picked out the biggest guy and you know, I, was, I was a small person. You know, I wasn't big, but I was fit. Mm -hmm. And so I picked that big guy and I got in his face a lot until he got to the point where I'm going to fight back. And when he did, I took him down. 
And after that, I had no problems with anybody after that. So that's what I was taught to do that, and that's what I did. And I did that in um, every platoon that I worked. All right. And then did that eventually cause problems for you? Yeah, it did. Um, the last platoon that I worked, we graduated, we graduated two platoons. Uh, took them right all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, the third platoon, I worked, um, I can't remember now exactly what it was, but there was some situation going on uh, somewhere else where they had to move a couple of us to another platoon. And so I got pulled out of that third platoon and started another. And uh, the sergeant that came with me, uh, we came, we had this one recruit, well, we had two that were problems right off the bat, and we knew they were going to be problems. Uh, Private Baker was one of them. I'll, I'll never forget that kid. He was overweight, slovenly, lazy, you know, little mama's boy. And so we just, we, we never, we weren't physical with him. Uh, we, we took this guy from sane, intelligent person and made him nuts. Uh, we had him believing he was seeing spaceships, and uh, I mean, we had we just we had a lot of fun with Private Baker. Um, made a little Sergeant Spandau made a a little spaceship and hooked lights on this thing. I can't remember now how he did it, but he had lights hooked on this. We had a wire that went from the top of the barracks down across our windows. Um, in the drill instructor's room and went right down alongside the windows past Private Baker's bed, the bunk, and we'd, we'd sudden that thing down, lit up, and it'd be down in there and swinging in the breeze, and we'd stop it at Private Baker's window and then go wake him up. Baker, look at that. And I'm just... He went, he went nuts. We, he was in the psych ward for a while, and they you released him from mm -hmm. gave him medical discharge. Uh, another one we had was from New York, and he was a mouthy kid, you know, so we were physical with him. Uh, he made it through. Uh, he, he was tougher than what we thought, but, and uh, at the end, uh, we, were, we were really hard on him. And harder than anybody else, but he made it through. And at the end, he came up and thanked us both. You know, and whether he meant it or not, I don't know. But uh, I think his name was Pardo or something like that. New York kid. Mm -hmm. And was that your last group that you worked then with? Then that was. Then uh, it wasn't. It, it wasn't long after that, after, after the Baker incident, I, we didn't, I didn't get to graduate that platoon. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, our whole company got relieved. But it went from, went from the captain on down. Every, our whole company was relieved for mistreatment. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were heavy-handed, uh, and it caught up to all of us, you know, the whole company was relieved and for punishment they sent me to work out at the boat basin uh, driving the general's boat, which I absolutely loved, a 28-foot mm -hmm. boat with two Grady White diesels on it. Uh, it, was, it was a nice machine. Uh, so I went fishing every day mm -hmm. until I got transferred to uh, Quantico, Virginia. And that was my last duty station at Quantico. Um, I was supposed to go to HMX-1, which is the Presidential Helicopter Squadron, um, because back when I was in uh, Vietnam, the first time in 65, they'd done a uh, security check on me. And I had a final top secret security mm -hmm. clearance for some reason. I'd, 
to this day, I don't know why, mm -hmm. but I had that clearance. And so I was supposed to go to HMX-1. Instead, I went to HMM-263, which is right next door, which was um, C Knight Helicopters, the twin rotor mm -hmm. blades. And I went there until um, September 74. All right. And at that point, basically, they're were they not letting you re-enlist, or did you decide just not to? No, I I had decided I had, I had wanted to re-enlist. Re I wanted to make I wanted to stay until I died because mm -hmm. you know, I absolutely loved the Marine Corps. Uh, my wife at the time said, "If you re-enlist again, I'm gone." You know, because her father had been in the Navy and the Army, retired, and had worked at Cherry Point, North Carolina, for thirty some years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he. She'd been in uh, Moorhead City, North Carolina, is a lot of military. Right. Because Cherry Point is 16 miles away. So she'd been around the military a lot, and she didn't want any more of it. But so I said, well, okay. So I got out mm -hmm. and uh, went to work for, we stayed in Moorhead City. Well, actually, near Jacksonville. Mm hmm. In, be, in between Jacksonville and, and Moorhead City, and I went to work for the Department of Transportation in North Carolina, driving a truck, uh, road maintenance, you know, pretty mundane stuff. And how long did you stick with that? Well, we were there, I don't know, maybe about a year, and a guy that I was working with was moving from there to Detroit. And I said, you know, Detroit, Muskegon, 200 miles. I said, I'll help you move your stuff to Detroit, and I'll go home. So I did that. I moved him to Detroit, dropped his stuff off, and I came to Muskegon and never left. I had, uh, we were up here maybe a week, and I said, uh, I'm not going back. Uh, so I called my wife and said, you know, sell the house. You know, we're moving up here. Uh, and I drove my truck to Detroit and let this guy take my truck back, and he gave it to my wife, and uh, I got a job in Muskegon. And what kind of work were you doing there? Uh, I was working at a, uh, a chemical plant, to, uh, making bottling, antifreeze, windshield washer solvent, that kind of thing. So, uh, did that for a while till I found a little better job. I went to work for a uh, uh, company that made um, display cases for stores, shoes, glass mm -hmm. display cases. Uh, went to work for them. I worked there. Uh, then I went down and got my wife, and by then she'd had another, had a daughter. So I had, we had two kids, so we got them and uh, moved them up up to Muskegon Heights. And, uh, I just, just worked. Kind of stayed in Michigan. Just stayed States. there. Stayed there until, oh, geez, 80-something. I got went to work for the post office in Muskegon. Uh, stayed there, I think, in... I think I went to work for the post office in 78 or 79, and uh, then we started having marital problems uh, and separated. Uh, got a divorce. She moved back to North Carolina, took the kids, and I met another lady at, at the post office, and we got married and had a, had a daughter. Uh, and being, uh, having post-traumatic stress, you know, I had, I was still having a lot of that. I had a lot of fat flashbacks mm -hmm. and still, still doing a lot of drinking. Uh, that marriage didn't work out either. Uh, I got transferred from Grand Ra or Muskegon to Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and worked at the post office here. And, uh, got a had a divorce, 
and met a lady there and we got married. Oh, geez, when was that? I don't know, we've been married 21 years now. Yep, you still got the ring, so that one worked. Yeah, All yeah right. that one worked. All right, uh, tell me a little bit about um, what it was like to be sort of military personnel back in the States there in the early 70s when, when you got back. Uh, to what extent did you encounter a kind of anti-war, anti-military oh, sentiment? Oh, there was a lot of that. Uh, the only safe place you could go would be VFW, American Legion, or some place where non-vets hung out. That was the safest place to go. Otherwise, any other, <coughs> I'd, any bar that I went to, you know, there'd be somebody in there. Of course, you know, then Vietnam was on TV every night. Mm -hmm. I mean, every night. And a lot of people, you know, protesters, they were protesting that. And there were some confrontations. I had some problems with that, uh, you know, a couple times somebody would say something derogatory about what was going on in TV and it didn't matter if I was the only non-vet there or there was two or three of us, it, it didn't matter. We were in the guy's face and I, there was, there was some uh, police involvement a few times, you know. All right. Uh, and did you have, how well did you, did you, did you talk to your family at all about no. this stuff? Or? No. I wouldn't, I'd, uh, the only one I could talk to was my dad. Mm -hmm. And he'd never told me a whole lot about his time in the service. He shot down a Japanese Zero. He was a belly gunner on a B-24, mm -hmm. I think. And so, you know, he had seen combat. He'd lost some friends. Uh, so he knew a little about combat, mm -hmm. you know, and he he never talked to it, talked to me much about it. The only time I ever heard anything about his time in the service when we'd go to see some of his friends that were in, and you know, then they'd have a few drinks and alcohol loosens things up. And of course, I was always right there, so because uh, then I could hear some mm -hmm. of the things that happened, uh, and it was probably just same with me you know um, I I wouldn't tell anybody I didn't I didn't tell my parents any of the things that I did until uh, in when was it 80 I got sent to I had to go to Battle Creek for a while uh, PTSD mm -hmm. got a hold of me and, and my parents came and visited one time and I had to, going through that training. They you had to tell some things mm -hmm. to get it out. And right. the, uh, before the only times I could tell anybody it would be another non vet, mm -hmm. so they knew. Um, and it was all non vets that were in this class. Um, of course, the instructors weren't; they were civilians. Um, and and it was hard to tell them that, but they keep at you, keep at you, keep at you. So you finally would. So then, finally, I could say some things to non non vets, and I was telling my folks one day some things. And my mother started crying, and she said, "You never told me that. I didn't know." I said, "I didn't want to tell you that, Mom. Mm -hmm. I couldn't." Now you had mentioned uh, before we started the interview that there was an occasion you actually went back to Muskegon and you visited your old high school a few years afterwards. Yeah, and so I forth. did. This was, I can't remember, I, I think I was home on leave. I was in between one of my duties and I'd just gone in to see some of my teachers and uh, of course the principal was still there, Mr. Kreisinga, and he said, he asked me if I'd talk to the senior class. And it, he said, you know, if it was coming up that they were going to have the recruiters come in. Mm -hmm. And when they did, then I went there when, they, when the recruiters were there. And of course, you know, they wanted me in my uniform. So I did that and I went in and I talked to the senior class. And uh, 
course, then I had some medals, you know. The, uh, kids were impressed, you know, they're easily impressionable. But I got to, I didn't, didn't go into any big detail, because mm -hmm. I still couldn't, you know, that was before I'd been to uh, Battle Creek, so I, I couldn't say any things, but, uh, you know, I told them a little bit, and, uh, of course, the first question they asked, you know, was, did you kill anybody? Mm -hmm. And I just said, well, I shot at somebody, but it wasn't confirmed, so and I left it at that. Mm -hmm. huh. Now, was that an experience you decided not to repeat, or? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't, I, I really could never talk about it. Uh, I, we did to other non-vets, mm -hmm. but only after a few beers. Right. You know, I still couldn't do it. If I was dead sober, I couldn't do it. I couldn't say anything about what I had done. But once the beer started flowing a little, you know, a couple shots, well, then it, then it gets easier. And then they'd say the same thing. Says, "Yeah, yeah." Well, and then it then it would start. All many was there, you know. Yeah, well, I got two. Mm. Yeah, well, I only got one. So oh. it was like that. All right. If you kind of look back at, at the time that you, you you spent in the Marine Corps and so forth, do you have kind of a balance sheet of sort of the the, the positive and the negative? I mean, what kind of effect? I mean, you've mentioned some of the effects that this has had on you. I mean, you, you take PTSD out of it and so forth. Uh, on the whole, would you, was the experience more positive than negative, or how would you characterize oh, it? Oh, it was definitely positive. Uh, Marine Corps made me a man. You know, they wrote an article about me <coughs> after I was wounded in the Muskegon Chronicle, and it you know, said a boy becomes a man fast at 19, and that it did. I grew up quick, mm -hmm. you know, going from the Midwest, comfortable, no cares, you know, no worries about anything, um, civilian life, going through uh, boot camp, learning some things, and then going to Vietnam when I was 19 years old and getting shot at and getting hit. It changes you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I saw the world in a different perspective, you know, so there's people out there that actually want to kill me. And so I have to kill them or be killed myself, and it, that's just the way it was. And it's, you know, I carry that yet today. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't hesitate. Somebody go to kill me, if, if I can take them out, I'm going to. So that, yeah. uh, but I love the Marine Corps. I love the the discipline, I love the st structure. Everything in a certain order, I love that. And I've tried to do that um, throughout my life. It worked fairly well with my first wife, but mm -hmm. you know, now it's, it's, I've gotten softer in my old age, mm -hmm. uh, things are different. But I still, I like to have order. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, are there individual sort of incidents or things that kind of stand out in your mind that you haven't mentioned here yet that uh, you're willing to add to the record? Or have you covered things pretty well as far as you're concerned? I've covered things pretty well, I believe. Um, you know, there's some things that I've done that I'm not proud of that I still won't talk mm -hmm. about to anybody. I don't care who it is, I won't. Uh, but pretty much, I think we've covered it. All right. Well, we've gone for the better part of two hours. You've covered quite wow. a bit and done a very good job of it. So thank you very much for coming in and talking to well, me Well, thank you. I certainly enjoyed it. All right. Okay. That'll do it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let me just switch off the mics here. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there was no building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done.